On behalf of the Library Board of Trustees, I want to welcome you to tonight's program, which is co-sponsored by the Harvard Bookstore in Harvard Square. I want to thank Rob Mitchell and his staff from the Harvard Bookstore for making books available for sale tonight. And I'd also like to thank Jim Aris and his staff from the City Cable Department for taping tonight's program so that we can make it available to a wider audience. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming programs that might be of interest to you. On November 4th, South African writer Andre Brink will be here to read from his new novel, Imaginings of Sand. On November 12th, Dulani Davis will be here to read from her new book, Maker of Saints. On November 14th, Boston Globe columnist Linda Weltner will be speaking at a Friends of the Library reception where two longtime library volunteers, Sylvia Pilch and Mary Shetterly, will receive the first annual Friend of the Library Award. If you'd like to get on our mailing list, please give me your name and address following tonight's program, and that'll keep you up to date on adult programs at the main library. Tonight, we celebrate strong-willed women. And I'm very pleased to introduce... <laughs> And I'm very pleased to introduce the chairperson of the Library Board of Trustees, Olive Johnson, who herself breaks the mold when it comes to being a strong-willed woman. This is a very special evening for me. And it, was, it started out beautifully. Dr. Elder and I were lost roaming around the building that I had been in for nearly 27 years. <laughs> but we found our way, didn't we, eventually? Dr. Jocelyn Elders was born Minnie Jocelyn Jones in Charles, Arkansas, to sharecroppers Haller and Curtis Jones. Haller was 19 years old when she gave birth to her first child in a three-room cabin with no indoor plumbing and no electricity. She began to teach her daughter to read at age four, just one year before Jocelyn began to assist her parents in the cotton fields. Her father hunted raccoon to feed his family, and he said this, he sold the skins to Sears for coats. Jocelyn had to walk five miles each morning to catch a bus to the segregated school that she attended. In spite of such hardships, five of the eight Jones children made it to college. At age 15, Dr. Elders won a scholarship to Philander Smith College in Little Rock. Her brothers and sisters helped to support her studies with their work in the fields, and she worked as a maid to earn living expenses. Elders met a physician for the first time during her freshman year in college. She told Claudia Dreyfus that, quote, she had never thought of becoming a physician. You can't become what you can't see. Her introduction to Edith Irby Jones, the first black woman to attend the University of Arkansas Medical School, motivated her to aim high. After receiving her BA, she enlisted in the Army as a first lieutenant. She used the GI Bill to attend the University of Arkansas Medical School, from which she was the only woman to graduate in 1960. Her outspoken determination and self-confidence were evident in her reply to a professor who offhandedly remarked, you know, you have as much education as a lot of white people. She responded, doctor, I have more education than most white people. Dr. Elders established herself at the University of Arkansas Medical School as a specialist in pediatric endocrinology. 
In 1967, Governor Bill Clinton appointed her as the state's public health chief. During her tenure, early childhood screenings increased tenfold. The immunization rate rose from 34% to 60%, and the number of women receiving prenatal treatment rose 17%, which reduced the state's infant mortality rate. In response to one of the many flaps that arose out of Dr. Elder's outspokenness, Governor Clinton said, now I know how Abraham Lincoln felt when he met Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is the little lady who started the Great War. Another one of Milt, Mr. Clinton's, President Clinton's mistakes. There's no such thing as a little lady among black women. In, 19, in 1993, after a difficult and contentious Senate confirmation process, Dr. Elders was sworn in as Surgeon General of the United States, the second woman and first African American to hold that position. In that capacity, she demonstrated the same determination and candor that won her the support of her governor and the outrage of her critics. Without further ado, it is not only a pleasure, but it is an honor to introduce Dr. Jocelyn Elders. Thank you very much. Thank you. I certainly want to thank Ms. Johnson Olive for that very excellent introduction. She's told you a lot of things about me that I've really spent a lot more time in detail telling you in this book, Joycelyn Elders, MD. I want to tell you that this book is not just about, most of you know about my being the Surgeon General. This book is not about just my being the Surgeon General. You see, I lived 63 years before I became your Surgeon General. And I want to tell you about some of that life. You need to know about what it was like growing up female in the South, in poverty, black, the oldest of eight children. You see, we didn't even know what it was like. We didn't have indoor water, plumbing, not even electricity. You're not even a bulb, you know, that just hang down on a string. We used kerosene lamps. And that was what I studied by until high school. I also want to tell you about going back after I became health director, seeing some of the things that I thought didn't exist anymore. You see, I had grown up in all of this severe poverty but I thought that these things didn't happen anymore and I found that they were still going on. In the Delta, they were black. And in the Ozarks, they were white. But they were still there. I saw children hungry in the richest country in the world. I saw children being abused I saw young women pregnant, often by somebody in their own home. Girls getting pregnant by men. That's not unusual. As 75% of all the teenagers who become pregnant, the fathers of their baby are not teenage boys. They're adult men. I want to tell you about being the first, the only black female, the only female. I was the only female that graduated in my medical school class. There were two young black men, but I was the first black intern, resident, 
chief resident, instructor, up to full professor at a Southern University. I want to tell you about a very difficult confirmation process and the lack of dignity in that process. I tell people often I went to Washington feeling like prime steak and left feeling like low-grade hamburger because of all the things that went on. But I will, let me tell you, I loved being your Surgeon General. I did that job the very best I knew how. I didn't go to Washington to get a job. I had a job. I went to Washington to do the job. And I want you all to know that if I had it all over to do over again, starting tonight, I would do it exactly the same way. I did it right the first time. I went to Washington feeling that I could bring about some change for the benefit of young people. But I came in contact with the most feared C word in the English language, change. People would tell me, well, Dr. Elder, the time's not right. The place is not right. The money is not right. The people are not right. Finally, of course, all of you know, they said, well, Dr. Elders, you're not right. <laughs> but I want you to know that that was just a bend in the road for me. It was not the end of the road that I'm still out there fighting and still feel very strongly. I, you know, I was associated with controversy and introduced as the controversial Surgeon General so much, I thought controversial was a part of what the Surgeon General was. <laughs> I was being called controversial. Let me tell you some of the things, some of the reasons I was controversial. I was controversial because I recommended that we have comprehensive health education programs in schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. The feeling was that there is that Surgeon General wanting to teach five-year-olds about sex. Well, I was wanting to teach five-year-olds that there are certain places on their body nobody should touch. If they do, they need to tell somebody. I was wanting to teach five-year-olds to feel good about themselves how to make decisions. And of course, everybody got on that I was, because I wanted to, we started some school-based clinics in the schools in Arkansas, and they called them, they felt that, and I wanted, in some of them we gave out condoms, and they said that I wanted to give out condoms, and I was called the condom queen. Well, I want you to know that I'd put the crown on my head and sleep in it <laughs> if everybody that needed to use one would use it when they needed to use it. The other thing that I was really uh, uh, controversial about is because I really suggested school-based health services. We have 50 million children in school every day, 110,000 schools. Why can't we provide primary preventive health care where our bright young people are? We say the major problems we've got in our society today are related to children having children. They're related to drugs, alcohol, poverty, AIDS. Those are all things that we could prevent, all things that we could teach children. And yet, we say if we tell them about it, they might do it. They're already doing it. If we would stop trying to legislate morals and start teaching responsibility, I think that we would end up much further down the road. We've, we've been out there trying to make sure that we worry, you know, we, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't think our, our people in Washington know but one A word, and that A word is abortion. 
Everything that comes up is related to abortion. I tried to tell him I, I'm not about abortion, that I'd never known any woman to need an abortion that was not already pregnant, but yet they didn't understand that. I said, if we prevent unplanned, unwanted pregnancies, abortions would become non-existent. But of course, they still wanted to talk about abortion. We've had more bills, and we've spent half as much time trying to talk about health care and health care access and trying to get health care for all of our people as we've spent arguing and fussing and bringing up bills about abortion. This country would have a health care system rather than being one of only two countries who do not have universal access to health care for all of its people. That really makes absolutely no sense. So of course I was beat on because of choice. Well, I frankly feel that women should have a right to choose. I felt, I, I didn't meet anybody while I was there that I thought knew enough, that was good enough, or who loved enough to make those kind of decisions for somebody else. I felt it was a decision between a woman her doctor, and her God. And of course, you know, I was given a talk at the National Press Club, and I was asked whether I felt the drugs, uh, would, uh, the legalization of drugs would reduce crime. That was the question I was asked. Well, every study that's ever been done says that the legal, the, the uh, decriminalization of drugs would reduce crime. I said, but I don't know all the implications of this. I feel it should be studied. Well, you know, I had always been taught, we doctors, that if you don't know something, if you don't know the answer, you study it. But of course, all the world rained down on me, but it was headlines that the Surgeon General recommended we legalize drugs. Well, you know, if I thought that, that had been the answer, I wouldn't have said study it. I would have said, I recommend we legalize drugs. But because I, you know, I just didn't know. I, and I still feel we need to study it. Anything that we're gonna spend 16 to $60 billion on a year, I feel we need to study it. And of course, all of you know that all of a sudden, you know, I, that I was at the UN giving a talk for World AIDS Day with a lot of African countries there. And during this, talk, during this talk, after the talk, we talked about the A, B, C, D of AIDS prevention. A for abstinence, B, be faithful, C, use a latex condom, and D, do other things. Well, a psychiatrist got up and asked me about masturbation as an alternative to sex, especially in many of the African countries where in some countries, HIV positive, in, uh, in their adults is up to 35%. And so I told him that I thought we, we talked about, I, you know, I kind of beat around the bush maybe a little bit, but I said, but I feel that uh, masturbation is a normal part of human sexuality. And I feel that we should teach your children that hair don't grow on their hands, they don't go blind, and they don't go crazy. Well, of course, nobody said anything about that, but about 10 days later, I want you to know I was called in by the secretary, called by the uh, uh, chief of staff to, and asked for my resignation. Well, I refused to resign until I talked to the president. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't think the president was going to call me. Every time I'd see him, he said, keep it up. So, well, but all of a sudden, I, the president calls me and he said, Joycelyn, we just can't have any more of, the, of this, and uh, I need your resignation on Panetta's desk by 2.30. I said, I said, Mr. President, I said, Did you, do you know what I said? And he said, yes, they told me. And I said, well, are you, I said, well do you understand what I said? He said, yes, they do, but I need your resignation on, and I, so I just said, I said, well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, that's the last time I've heard from the president, the last time I've talked with the president, but I want you to know that, um, I, I, I felt the things that I was talking about were really, I didn't feel that I was lying about any of them. It said that 90% of men masturbate, 80% of women masturbate, and the rest lie. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I thought that if something was going on that was normal, 
you know, that, that there was really no need of uh, us continuing to get involved and lying about it. So those were some of the things that happened in Washington. And I'm going to tell you just very quickly some of the things that happened in my life, and then we can stop and, and talk about uh, other parts of it. Well, as I told you about my growing up and going to this one-room school, well, when I graduated from college, I didn't, high school, I had never heard of college. I didn't know anything about going to college. And because, well, nobody in my family had ever been to college, and my mom had always said, get a good education, but to her, that meant finish high school. Well, I was there, and there was this man who offered a scholarship to the, uh, of the student who was the valedictorian of the class. Well, I happened to be the valedictorian of the class. And, but I didn't know you had to apply. I didn't know you had to do anything. So my sisters and brothers picked cotton in order for me to have bus fare to go to school. It was $3.83. We picked all day. And I remember my brother, who's a minister now, looking up, he was about five years old, and he wanted to know, do we have enough yet? And I'll never forget that, because it wasn't a mean, do you have enough yet? It was, he was asking whether we needed to keep on picking. Well then, I went to college, and nobody ever heard of me when I went to register. So I went back out and I sat down and I started to cry. You see, we had worked so hard to get $3.83. And they were talking about $800 when I went up to register. So you know that I couldn't begin to think of anything like that. Well, finally, I was sitting out in the hall and this big man, Dr. M.L. Harris, who was president of that college, came out and started talking to me. Oh, you know, he asked me, well, young lady, what's the matter? And so I started telling him. When I started telling him, I just started bawling. <laughs> and, and then, well, he said, well, you just go on down there, and they'll find you a place to sleep, and we'll work it out. Well, we worked it out. And I, I went to Philander Smith College. I finished in three years, graduated at age 18, went to the Army. And while I was in, while, while I was in college, the first black student, who happened to be a black woman, came to speak at Philander Smith College, Dr. Edith Irby Jones. And she talked about the difference between taking the high road and taking the low. And that was the first time I'd ever really seen a doctor. And after that moment, I wanted to be just like her. People have often asked me, say, Dr. Elders, did you always want to be the Surgeon General? Well, as you've heard, I said, you can't be what you can't see. So I'd never even seen a doctor, so how could I always want to be the Surgeon General? But after I saw Dr. Jones, I always wanted to be just like Dr. Jones. Well, I fin went to finish medical school, did an internship at the University of Minnesota, and then I became a resident at the University of, of Arkansas, and finally the chief resident. And there was nine bright young doctors there who to this day still call me chief. And I'm very proud of that. And of course, I started doing research. I got a career development award. And I really learned to be a real professor. I tell you about some of the real terrible incidents, some of the things that went on during those, th during those difficult times. It, it, as I outlined it in the book, some of the things that I had to go through, walking through water, mud, and all, and all of that, how my brother, who had a sw real swollen abdomen, and my dad took him 13 miles on the back of a mule, and a doctor put a drain in, we realized now he had appendicitis, and he sent him back home. Well, that brother grew up to be a veterinarian, you know, I guess that's the way you treat uh, horses and cattle. But anyway, those are some of the things that I wanted to tell you about my life, some of the things that I felt that, that, I, that I wanted to say. 
So in this book, I've outlined some of the things, my recommendations, some of the things I feel that we need to do, and I really even made my predictions for the future. So that's what Joycelyn Elder's MD is about. And if you're thinking that you're gonna get an inside book on Washington, you don't need to buy this book. <laughs> but if you want to know what it was like growing up in the South, some of the problems you faced, some of the recommendations that I'm making that, that we need to do to make a difference in our society, and, and not, well then, I think that this is a book about growing up in the South, the details, some of our history, and some of the things that I feel that we need to do in my projections for the future, especially in the area of healthcare. Thank you very much.